Yes. We do want you to join a small group today, but we're going to save that for last and let you know a little bit about that a little bit later on. Thank you, team. Well, I am completing the last in our series today, at the last of our series, Chasing Shadows. We spent the last few weeks just looking through some Old Testament scriptures at uh, where we can see in those places a foreshadowing of Jesus, a, a shadow of Christ to come, uh, where we can see this picture painted where God is leading us to uh, when we see the fulfillment of what Christ came to do and who He came to be. And I don't know about you, but I have found it incredibly fascinating. I've learned so much over the last few weeks, and I've just been loving being able to look at uh, some of these stories. And I've got one for you today that I just hope will be an encouragement to you. I just really believe in my heart that it's a word for some people in the room today and, and just praying that you're going to get some hope from it. Um, as you sit, Steve sends his love and says hello. He is with our Papakura campus. Right now he'll be preaching as well, just wrapping up his message. And so they've had a great morning across there. But of course, he always makes sure, he says, always says to me, babe, make sure you tell them where I am. Make sure you say hi for me. And then I forget. All the time, I forget. And so guys, if he asks you, you let him know. I did. I said hi. I let him know where you are. All right. We're looking at Joshua chapter 2 today. And it's a message I've titled, A Lifeline of Hope. And we're looking at a place in Joshua chapter two when Joshua, the leader of the Israelites, he's a new leader, he's just taken over after the death of Moses. He sends two spies into the land of Canaan, the land that God had promised to them. This is the promised land. This is the land that God said would be theirs. He sends two spies in to scout out the land. And these spies along their journey find themselves at the house of a woman named Rahab. It's important that we know that Rahab is a prostitute and her house is located within the city walls, within the walls of Jericho. Now, Rahab takes these spies into her home and the king of Jericho hears that there are some Israelite spies scouting out the land and he wants a word with them. Now, my instincts tell me that he wants more than a word, but <laughs> the scriptures just say that he wants them to be brought to him. So instead, though, of letting them know where they are, Rahab lies to the king and she sends him on a wild goose chase over the countryside, telling them, oh, they went in that direction. I think they went over there. All the while, they're hiding right there in her roof. And so we pick up the reading of our story in Joshua 2, verse 8. It says, before the spies went to sleep that night, Rahab went up on the roof to talk with them. I know the Lord has given you this land, she told them. We are all afraid of you. It's really important to note that. Everyone in this land is living in terror. For we have heard how the Lord made a dry path for you through the Red Sea when you left Egypt. And we know what you did to Shihon, to Sihon and Og, the two Amorite kings east of the Jordan River, whose people you completely destroyed. No wonder our hearts have melted in fear. No one has the courage to fight after hearing such things. For the Lord your God is the supreme God of the heavens above and the earth below. What I find really interesting in reading this passage of Scripture is thinking back to numbers when we hear about a moment when, God, when Moses does a similar thing to Joshua except Moses sends 12 spies. Can you remember that back in Numbers? Moses sends 12 spies into the very same land, the land of Canaan, the promised land. He sends 12 spies in to scout out the land. And they bring back a report that spreads fear among the Israelite people. They come back saying, oh, the people who live in that land are like giants. We're like grasshoppers in comparison to them. We couldn't possibly fight them. They spread this report. And the people of Israel are so fearful of those living in Canaan that they refuse to go in and take the land that God had already said is yours. I find it really interesting then, now reading Rahab's words to these two Israelite spies. Whereas Rahab tells them right there and then, that the people that they had feared all this time were actually afraid of them all along. Isn't it so interesting? Isn't it so interesting that so often some of the things we see as setbacks in our life, God is actually using to set us up. 
And I wonder how many of you have got some setbacks in your life, some setbacks that at first glance you think are gonna become disappointments in your life. They're gonna be obstacles for you to overcome. I wonder how many of you are experiencing a setback that God wants to take, turn around and use to set you up for the plans and the purposes that He has for your life. I love this about our God. This is what I love about the God that we serve. I love that He can take any disappointment He can take our failures and our mistakes. He can take the things that we would say set us out of the game and He can turn them around and He can use them for both His good and His glory. It's all throughout the pages of Scripture. He does it time and time again where someone falls into what we would see as a setback, but He takes that circumstance, He turns it around and He sets them up for the purposes and plans that He's got for their life. I just love that about our God. You see it in Scripture, page after page, chapter after chapter, story after story. And we can see it right here in Rahab's story. We can see it right here in Rahab's story where God takes a prostitute and uses her to become a crucial role in the story of redemption. Not only that, but she, we find Rahab in the bloodline of Christ. Man, that's a turnaround God right there. And she goes on, she says to, uh, she says to them, she says, I want you to swear something to me. I want you to make a promise to me, boys. She says, because I have been kind to you, I need you to be kind to me. She says, when you guys all come back and you destroy the city and you take it down, she says, I need you to promise me that you are gonna spare my life and the life of my family as well. So they say to her in Joshua chapter two, verse 14, says, the men answered her, we will give our lives for yours. Wow, that's a promise. Uh, That's a pretty big promise. We'll give our lives for yours. If you don't report our mission, we will show kindness and faithfulness to you when the Lord gives us this land. Then she let them down by a rope through the window since she lived in a house that was built into the wall of the city. Go to the hill country so that the men pursuing you won't find you, she said to them. Hide there for three days. Three days until they return, afterward go on your way. What I want you to notice firstly, is that the word used here to describe what Rahab lowers the men down on is the word rope. I need you to remember that as we read the next part of the story. The word is rope. In verse 17, it says, the men said to her, we will be free from this oath you have made us swear unless when we enter the land, you tie the scarlet cord to the window through which you have let us down. Bring your father, mother, brothers, and all your father's family into your house. If anyone goes out the doors of your house, his death will be his own fault and we will be innocent. But if anyone in your house should be harmed, his death will be our fault. And if you report our mission, we are free from the oath you have made us swear. She said, let it be as you say. And she sent them away. After they had gone, she tied a scarlet cord to her window. I want you to notice that the word used to describe what she tied to her window was the word cord. We need to take note that these two ropes were two different items. We've got to remember that as our story continues. Let's just recap what has happened here. We've got two spies in the promised land hiding out in the home of a prostitute named Rahab. When it's safe to do so, she lowers them out via a rope. She lowers them out her window. She tells them to go and hide, go away for three days. Three days, three days. Is that ringing any bells for anybody? Three days, she tells them to go and hide. And then once it's safe, they can go on their way. When it comes time, she makes this promise for them that when it comes time, when they return, returning her kindness, she is to spare their life. And when they come to take the land that God had promised them, they have made an oath to her that so long as there is a scarlet cord hanging from her window, her and anyone else in her house will be spared. Now, this may be sounding 
like a familiar story to you. And that is because if we are going to look forward to see a foreshadowing of Christ, we actually firstly need to look back to another story that we find in Exodus chapter 12, where God sends Moses to say to his to Pharaoh, let my people go. After 400 plus years in slavery, God's t- it's time for God to free his people from under Pharaoh. And God sends Moses to say, let my people go. Ha- Pharaoh's heart is hardened. And God has to send 12 plagues in order for Pharaoh to move his hand and let the- and release the Israelites from slavery. Now, I don't know about you, but I would have been done at plague one. I'd have been like, okay, all right, take them, take them, take them. But Pharaoh gets to, his heart is so hardened, he gets to 12 plagues. The 12th plague is this, that every firstborn male should die. All except those who come under these particular instructions that God gives to the Israelite people. He tells the Israelite people to take a sacrificial lamb, an innocent lamb, and take the blood of that lamb and post it on the doorposts and on the lentil above the doorway. And every single person who is within the walls of that house, when the time was to come under the covering of the blood of that sacrificial lamb, would be spared. We can read it in Exodus 12, verse 13. It says, the blood on the houses where you are staying will be a distinguishing mark for you. When I see the blood, I will pass over and no plague will be among you to destroy you when I strike the land of Egypt. And this is where we can begin to see the shadow form really quickly. And because when we jump forward to John 1, verse 29, John the Baptist describes Jesus as the Lamb of God, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. See, what we've got to remember is that at Jesus' death, He became that Lamb. He became that sacrificial, innocent Lamb who through the shedding of His blood and the covering of His blood over you and I, our lives would be spared and we would walk in freedom should we find ourselves under the covering of His blood. So let's go back to the rope. The rope, the scarlet cord, which not coincidentally is the color of blood. The rope that points us both back to the Passover lamb, the Passover lamb whose blood covered the homes of the Israelites, the Passover lamb whose blood covered the homes of the Israelites, that became the distinguishing mark that death would pass over and everyone in the home would be spared. And also pointing us to the Lamb of God who would come, whose innocent blood would be shed, that if we were to come under the covering of that blood, our lives would be spared and we too would walk in freedom. Can you see the shadow? Can you see the shadow? What else is really interesting that I want us to take note of today because it's applicable to our lives is actually something I discovered about these two ropes. See, what's interesting is that the rope that was used to lower them in down, that word rope written in the Scriptures comes from the original root word shevel, which means to be bound by or marked out by. But it also speaks of pain, destruction, and sorrow. And yet this Word that's used to describe what she hangs out the window, this scarlet cord, the word cord, actually comes from the root word of a different word. It's from the word tikva, which means hope, expectation, hope for what is to come, an expectation for that which you are waiting for. And I can't help but see, as I read Rahab's story, that there was a trade that she made when she traded off the sorrow and destruction that could bind her. And she made a trade for the hope and expectation of the promise that was to come. And all I see when I read the story of Rahab is a lifeline of hope. 
I see a thread of hope running through the entire story. And I have to let you know that there is a thread of hope for your life too. There is a lifeline of hope threading through the story of your life that God is writing. And I want to let you know just three areas I think we find it. The first place is this. There is hope in the waiting. There is hope in the waiting. Now, I think one of the greatest gifts technology has given the world is online shopping. <laughs> All right, I mean, are you with me? Any online shoppers out there? Come on, I should get a hearty amen right now. Online, I mean, come on, I think, I don't know, there's nothing better than a good online shop, isn't, am I right? Okay, so the thing about it is, is that you can be anywhere in the world. You can be on any computer. You can be absolutely anywhere. And within the click of a button, you can have all your heart's desires winging its way to you. Just the click of the button. The only problem I find with online shopping is that the purchase happens in an instant, but the receiving of your item, well, that takes time, doesn't it? See, the problem with online shopping is in the waiting. Because you know those torturous five to 10 working days. You know the weight, the torture of that weight. Why do they say, why is it working days? That's what I wanna know. Why do you have to skip the weekends? Just keep rolling through the weekends. It would get it to me faster. But you know, don't you, when, you, when, I, when I finish my purchase, you know what I do? I go immediately to my, my, in my email inbox. Because you know that in a, if they're real clever in a few hours, but sometimes it's a few days, you know that into your inbox is gonna come that little seed of hope. That little seed of hope. That little seed of hope, that email that says, your order has been received and your parcel is on its way. Oh, oh, that moment, right? And then along the journey, seeds of hope sprinkled in your email inbox. Your package has been picked up by the courier. Yes, it has. Your package has arrived in New Zealand. You know it has. And then there's that glorious text message that you get in the morning before you've even woken up from the courier saying, your package is on its way. It's been dispatched. The delivery guy's got it and he's on his way in his little yellow and red van and he is coming to you. <laughs> See, I can handle the waiting of my online shop if I know it's on its way. Where I get shifty and I get impatient is when I don't know when, I don't know where, I don't know if I've even received my order. Because waiting's hard but it's harder without hope. And I can't help but think that for you and I in our waiting seasons, that waiting becomes bearable when we have an assurance that our provision, that our breakthrough, that the answer to prayer that we're believing for, that the promise is on its way. That brings us hope in our waiting. And I can only imagine that for Rahab, as she lowered down those men out of her home and saw them run off, off into the distance, I can only imagine in that moment how torturous the wait would have been. How doubt would have began to come into her mind. She would have begun to question everything and wonder if she'd made the right decision and were they really gonna come through on the promise See, if it weren't for the scarlet cord that she hung out that window, if it weren't for the hope that hung out her window, this very cord, the fact that this cord hung meant that she had hope. This cord was a representation of the hope and expectation that she was able to carry as she waited for her salvation to come. Every time she saw it, she would have known, I can have hope. 
I can have hope that my salvation is on its way. The very fact that this thing was hanging in her window meant there was hope in her waiting season. And I have to tell you that you and I in Christ can have that same hope in our waiting season. Christ in our lives means that we can make the trade We can trade in the pain and the destruction that keeps us bound in our waiting season. And we can pick up the hope and expectation of the promise that Christ has given to us. Let me ask you this. What is it you are waiting for? What are you waiting for in your life? What season of waiting are you in? Are you in a season of waiting career-wise, for the dream to come about, for a door of opportunity to open, uh, for the job to come. What are you waiting for? Are you waiting for the house, the dream house, the first house? What are you waiting? Are you waiting for the marriage or the baby or the restoration of a relationship? Are you waiting for healing? Are you waiting for provision? What is it in your life that you are waiting for? And then let me ask you this. While you wait, what are you holding on to? Are you holding on and clinging to the pain and sorrow that comes in a waiting season? Or, or are you clinging to hope? To hope and expectation that says, I'm holding on, I'm waiting for my promise because I've got an assurance. It's on its way. Christ is our assurance. Christ is our assurance. He's our scarlet cord. The hope that we have, that the promise, the provision is on its way. There is hope in the waiting. The second thing I want you to know is that there is hope in the ruins. There is hope in the ruins. And if we jump forward in our story to Joshua chapter six, we see this kind of weird military strategy that God asks the Israelites to take on. See, it's time for the Israelites to come and conquer Jericho. It's time for them to come and take the land. And God gives them a military strategy that, look, listen, I'm, I'm, I have never been in the army. I have never been in any kind of military force, but I would say that this is not a very good strategy. He asked the Israelites to, for six days, march around the city walls in silence, just once each day, and then that's it. Now, okay, all right, maybe it's like an intimidation game, you know, like maybe this mind game he's trying to play with them just to, you know, put a bit of fear into them. I don't know. But okay, all right, God will do that. Then on the seventh day, he says to them, on the seventh day, guys, I want you to march around the walls of Jericho seven times. Seven times. And then on the seventh time, we're going to blow some horns. I'm like, all right, okay, all right, God. This is not a good military strategy. This is not going to get us into that city. This is not going to have a takeover effect. But on the seventh time, the horns blow, and he says to them, if you do what I say, as I say it, those city walls will come crumbling down. And we read about it. We read it right there in black and white. In Joshua 6, verse 20, it says, so the troops shouted and the ram's horns sounded. And when they heard the blast of the ram's horns, the troops gave a great shout and the wall collapsed. It worked. It worked. The craziest military strategy we've ever heard, but it worked. The troops advanced into the city, each man straight ahead, and they captured the city. Let's not forget, though, whose house was built into the walls of that city. Rahab. Rahab. Rahab's house was in the walls that just collapsed. Hello? Anybody getting some alarm bells here? I cannot imagine the fear that would have been in Rahab. As she stood in her house, how terrified she must have felt to be surrounded by walls that began to shake. She would have heard trumpets, but she would have seen the crazy Israelites marching around and round and thought, what on earth are they doing? (laughs) 
She would have heard the trumpets, the horns. She would have heard the shout and all of a sudden the rumble. The rumble. The ground begins to shake. The walls begin to tremor. Things on the wall of the house, pots begin to fall over, come crashing to the ground. Everything around her, everything that's holding her up would have been shaking Everything around, the walls would have crumbled and everything but the floor that she stood on would have become ruins. And yet, because of a rope that hung, she had hope that even if everything around her fell down, she would be secure. Even in the ruin, she had hope. She had hope. Hope, because of a rope that hung in the window, she knew, she knew her promise was on its way. Even in the ruins of her life, let's not forget that Rahab's ruins were not just physical. They were not just about concrete walls or a house collapsing. Rahab was a prostitute. And I have no doubt that that was not the picture of life that she had for herself. I have no doubt that Rahab would have had regrets in her life that saw herself now living a life of sin and pain and sorrow. I I wouldn't think for any second that this would have been the life that Rahab chose for herself, but through I don't know, circumstances or consequences of decisions and choices that she made, that other people made for her or to her, that she now found herself living a life that I think we could probably accurately describe as ruins. But I, I can't help but see in some of the conversation that she has with these two spies that this life of ruin was not a life she was ready to choose anymore, that she was ready to rebuild her life. See, in the conversation that she has with the two spies, she declares that their God is the supreme God. In that very statement, we can know this, that she was determined to make a decision. She was saying in that statement, what she was saying was this, I no longer want to come under or follow the sinful, destructive life that I have been living and that the people in my city have been living. She was looking at their God and saying, I want that God. I want that life. I want to follow. I want to join myself. I want to bind myself to that God, the supreme God. What she was saying was, I don't want this life of ruins anymore. I'm going to pick up my broken life. I'm going to pick up my ruins. And I want to rebuild beautiful a different way, a different way. And I wanna ask you today, when you look around your life, what do you see? What do you see? Because as I was preparing this message, as I was writing it, I really felt that there are some people here in the room today who could honestly say that if you look around your life, what you see is ruins. The ruins of mistakes, the ruins of brokenness, the ruins of regret, the ruins of failure, the ruins of a past you can't go and redo, the ruins of a clock you can't turn back. And I wanna remind you today that when everything around you is falling down, even when there is destruction on every side, with Christ, we can carry a hope that says, even in my ruins, I can live with hope and expectation that there's a promise coming, that this is a God who can take any broken thing and make it whole again. There is hope in your ruins, amen? One last thing I wanna remind you of today is that there's hope in community. Our team are gonna come and join me now. There is hope in community. I want to take a moment in this message to speak to you about zebras and ostriches. Zebras and ostriches. Because what's interesting to know about zebras and ostriches is that 
they are prey for faster animals. And so they're always at risk of being caught and eaten by somebody else. And so they have to have this heightened sense of awareness so that they can avoid being caught and eaten. There's just this one problem. Well, actually, there, there's two problems here. Zebras have got really good eyesight, but they've got a really bad sense of smell. And ostriches have got a really good sense of smell, but their eyesight is not so good. And so alone, each of them lacks the heightened senses to keep themselves safe from predators. So do you know what they do? These two different species, they're real smart. These two different species, they live together. And they've created a, a connection, a relationship. They hang out together and they rely on one another to help them stay safe from predators. Together, this relationship takes place where the, they, they rely on the eyes of the zebra and the nose of the ostrich to keep the predators at bay. It's what they call symbiosis. Symbiosis is this connection, this relationship between two different species that it becomes a mutual, mutually beneficial relationship. This relationship that says, I need you and you need me. And you know what? I think we need some symbiosis in our lives. I think we need some symbiosis in our lives. I think we need this relational connection with each other that says, I need you and you need me. You see it here with Rahab and the spies. She, she knew in this, in this scenario, she was able to help them. And because she helped them, they then helped her. In their moment of need and trouble, she came and helped them and, and, and supplied for them. And then in her moment of desperation, there was this mutual relationship where they she needed them and they needed her. There is a hope in living in community, that living life in community, a hope that says in your night time of need, you can count on me. And then a knowledge that says in my time of need, I know I've got someone I can lean on. There is so much hope in that, so much hope in that. And that's why here it comes we believe in small groups. You guys all knew that was coming. As soon as I said the word community, you were like, I know where she's going with this one. Thank you. I work really hard on this. Small groups. And listen, we believe in them because we believe that in small groups you find symbiosis a mutually beneficial relationship that says I need you and you need me, that says we need, we need each other. We need each other. And I don't know what you're going through. And I don't know what you will go through. Because I can guarantee if you're not going through something right now, there will be something in the future. And I'm not prophesying anything over anybody. That's just life, right? And so there's gonna come a time where well, you need each other. Because I don't care what you say, you can't do it on your own. You need somebody. And listen, somebody needs you. Somebody needs you. Let me pray for you today. Thank you, Jesus. God, I thank you that we, that we have this hope in you. We thank you, Lord Jesus, that in every season, because of what you did on the cross, we can always have a hope. We can have hope in our waiting season. I lift up every person to you right now who's in a waiting season. And I pray, oh God, that you would help them in that season. Lord, help them not to give up. Help them to hold on. Lord, I pray their faith would be built from today, oh God that they would walk out of here with a new expectation that their promise, their parcel is on its way and that they can carry hope. God, I thank you for those who are 
feel like their life is in ruins. God, I thank you that you are a God who can take something broken and you can make it beautiful again. And I thank you that even when everything else is falling down, our hope is in the firm foundation of building a life in Christ. And God, I thank you that you have created us to be together. Lord, that you have created us for community. And I pray that every person in this room would find their community, their symbiosis community. I thank you that people need them and that they need others. I wanna pray one prayer really quickly. You might be in the room today and you might say, Bex, I don't really know God. I'm not a Christian, I just came to church. Maybe someone brought you along or perhaps you've been coming along for a while now and you've never made that decision. Well, today's your day. Some of you know you came here to make that decision today. And I would love to lead you in a prayer in a few moments time because God loves you. Man, does He love you. He created you and He's got a plan and a purpose for your life that will just blow your mind. The problem is, is that at some point in our lives, we all walk away. We do our own thing. We make mistakes. We mess up. The Bible calls it sin, and that sin, it separates us from God. But He didn't want us to be separated from Him, so He sent His Son, Jesus, to come and live a sinless life on earth and die a sinner's death, to pay the debt that you and I were due for our sin so that we could be reconciled to Him. And I'm gonna pray a prayer, and all I want you to do is pray this prayer with me. You don't have to pray it out loud. I'll pray it out loud, and you just pray it along with me in your heart. We say, dear Jesus, Thank you that you went to the cross for me, that you paid the debt that I was due. I choose this day to live for you. I choose your forgiveness today. Thank you that there is a purpose for my life. In Jesus' name, with every head still bowed and eye closed, I would love to know who I prayed for. I'm not gonna ask you to come down the front or stand up or anything like that. We don't wanna embarrass you, but we would love to be able to just acknowledge that you prayed that prayer today. I'm gonna count to three in just a moment's time and love for you just to lift your hand as I count to three. Just lift it up so I can see it. I'll see it, I'll acknowledge it. You can pop it straight back down. Are you ready? Let's be brave together. Be bold, be brave. One, two, three. Hands can go up. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Awesome. I see you over here to my left. Yes, thank you. You're saying, Bex, can you count me in on that prayer? I prayed it. Awesome. I can see you down here. Yes, on my right. Thank you. Amazing. Anybody else? You're saying, Bex, count me in. Prayed that prayer. Really meant it. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. God, we thank you for these lives that have come back to you today. We thank you for the purposes and the plans that you have for them. And I pray your protection over them as they leave this place today. We're so excited for them, Lord. And right now, as all of heaven celebrates, we celebrate too. Come on, church. Would you give God some praise? Isn't He a good God today? Amazing. Hey, if you made the decision today, I want to say we're so proud of you. You made a great decision. And we'd love to encourage you. We'd love to get in contact with you. Right now, there's a link in the description. Uh, please hit that. Say, I've committed my life to Jesus. And we'd love to get in contact with you. And maybe you want to know more about us at Elam Christian Center. You can head to our webpage, again, in the description, elamchristiancenter.org.nz. We'd love to get connected with you and help you on this journey of faith. But before we end, I'd just love to pray a prayer of blessing on you before you go. God, we just thank you, every single person tuning in today, every single person viewing this video. God, would you bless them? God, would you lead them? Would you guide them? Would you have your hand on them, God? In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Well, hey, if you are blessed by this video, I want to encourage you to share it. Show it to somebody and I know they'll be blessed by it too. See you next week.